So why do we journal? So, you know, that could be a, a three hour workshop, but um, I'm going to take you through the main points. So think about catching and containing, because that is true, isn't it? That, you know, we, um, as you just heard around eating and as you've heard the whole morning, we just in our world and so unconscious. So catching and containing. So something amazing comes into your mind, or maybe you have an amazing dream. I'm going to talk about that. Or you have this, this morning, an epiphany, like, ha, oh, this is linked to this. Um, so whatever it is, you can catch and contain. And there are all these patterns around us. If you think about it, you know, we surrounded by patterns and things unfolding all the time. And sometimes you can just capture them and just put them down. And when you look back, I've got journals from when I was a teenager. And it's phenomenal when you look back and you think, oh, interesting, that pattern is still here. So when I was little, I used to cry bitterly whenever there were storms and things because I was so worried about the bugs and things, you know, that they didn't have um, cover and I hoped that they were hiding somewhere. And I'm now 53 and I still do that when there's a storm, when there's a cold snap, oh, little bugs. And, um, you know, so that hasn't changed. That's a theme through all my journals. And then other patterns do change. So sometimes maybe we put better boundaries as we get older and we look back at a journal 10 years ago and you think, oh, I've changed. So lovely reason to journal. And of course, the inner patterns and inner stories. Yes, I always like to journal when there's been sort of an epiphany or I've noticed something different or just something that's mattered to me. And of course, dream messages. So I'm going to be talking quite a lot about dream journaling. So um, when we get to that point, I'll talk about whether you remember your dreams or whether you don't and then what you can do about it. Okay, so think about the act of writing. So you've just heard about the act of eating. And before that, somewhere there was the act of breathing and moving. So think about slow food versus takeout. So, you know, I know they put a lot of oil in takeout, so that's why it tastes nice. But, you know, we, we are a takeout society. So we scroll, we, we just read the first three, four words of something. Oh, that hasn't got my attention. Click, click, click all the channels. We're driving down the road and there's this assault on the senses. So slow food tastes different. And I think you can all agree with me that when you taste food, that somebody's kind of really, you know, prepared carefully and, and lovingly and with focus and then let it blend and let it cook. We're all salivating now. That's very different than take out, in, out, down the hatch. Oh, I better get another one. So we know that the act of writing slows it down. Whenever there's something significant, it's always better to write it. And think about when you get a handwritten note versus just like a picture. You know, it's different. It's different. And this is exactly it, that as we're writing, there, there's the hidden stuff, the murky stuff, the stuff that's down there, um, and stuff you maybe weren't aware of. Also worries, concerns. Maybe as you're writing, you, oh, I didn't know that was on my mind. So all of this reflecting stuff kind of bubbles up to the top and it happens naturally when you write longhand and often just naming things is powerful so if you've got a fear I always use this analogy if you hear a weird sound in the night like a scratching or something rather go and look at what it is even if it's something horrible just know what it is as opposed to this nameless faceless thing so same as with feelings when you just feel not nice you know but unsettled or just not yourself and you start to write, I promise you, the monster will pop up and you'll name it. And often that's what shrinks it right down. But even if it doesn't, at least you know who it is and then what you need to go and get help with. Right. So, and think about, I don't know if this has happened to you, but this happens in my office and it happens for me. I've got three sisters and a brother. So I'm very, very fortunate that when we're chatting and often it is just a WhatsApp, but in the telling something pops out and I realize hmm, that was on my mind and no way are we, we more unedited than in our journals so when you're telling the story it pops out and sometimes an answer pops out and it's oh yes so I had to have a difficult conversation with someone yesterday that's been waiting for weeks and I journaled just my feelings about it and my thoughts and something popped up that actually changed the whole course of the conversation and when I was telling beforehand someone, you know, about what I was going to say, in the telling, the other piece popped up. And when I had the conversation, it just wasn't difficult anymore. 
And so that's what your journal's about. Okay. Now, I've got a little challenge for you this morning. So I love language. And I think you're going to see why I have such an appreciation for it. And all of you do as well. You love people. And you are, are not doing online, you know, where you're just typing in stuff. You're actually connecting with people through language. So there's a clue as to what's going to come up here. So if you took a fish and you think about what, what substrate is the fish in? Well, the fish is in water. Does it know it's in water? No, just chilling out in the water. Okay. So if you took a bird, what's the bird doing? Well, the bird is in the air a lot of the time. And does it know that it's in the air? Not necessarily. It's just, you know, flying around in the air. So I'll take one of these. What's this one in? Well, we can be in water. We can be on land. We can be in the air. You know, humans go everywhere, even to the moon. So what is the actual core thing that we're immersed in? And that would be language. So think about it. You know, all living things have a form of communication, but only humans actually have language. So we hand down legends and, and we put down in our journal all sorts of language and we write notes to each other. You know, everything is in a sea of language. And this is why journaling just helps you immerse in there and make sense of it. So you can maybe just keep that in mind as we go. So another reason for journaling, which is quite enjoyable, is creation. So sometimes you've got sort of a glimmer of an idea and you pop it into your journal. So I've got different journals for different things. And um, so you could have sort of a half-formed idea for a talk or, a, you know, I had all my talks like that. Um, I put them in a particular talk journal and I start throwing things around there. So um, half-formed ideas need time to cook, don't they? They need time to percolate. So there we go. And first thing in the morning thoughts are often your most creative. As you wake up, maybe you want a dream journal, but maybe you've had this idea and it just, oh, it's there, it's fresh. And you pop that in. And then later through the day, it percolates a bit and then it comes out as something. So you want to catch those fleeting what ifs. And then the other reason for journaling is to make things matter. So sometimes you have such a big thing happen in your life and you feel amazing. So, you know, think about our girl Tatiana, who just won this gold medal for swimming. You could feel and just it was so clear about how she felt and it just was wonderful. And I think we were all rejoicing for her. And the thing is, you know, right now we feel it, she feels it or think about the rugby, everything is going on there, that's gonna happen later today. So, you know, these are just two sport examples that's got the whole country going. And then think about some of the horrible things that have happened the last while, and we just felt. And so how you feel at that time, and maybe the insights that you had, um, think about what got you into working at SADAC, or what got you into counseling. Sometimes it's just, you were moved by something that you saw or heard. And, Sometimes it's beautiful just to journal that. So if I think of meditation, I love meditation. I, I do it every day. And um, I had the great privilege many years ago of going to the mother center of the group that I'm part of and just sitting in that temple. And there were about 3,000 people spread out, you know, in tents all around. And I happened, there was one memory, I was sitting in the middle and it's an octagon shape. And the teacher was right in the front with a beautiful shrine of things. And the sun came through. And it just that moment, I'll never forget. And that must be about 16, 17 years ago. And so I journaled that. And so when I look at that piece in my journal, I feel it again. So sometimes we need inspiration. Sometimes it's sad feelings. Sometimes it's, it's shocking feelings. And sometimes we need to just get that done. So we make it matter because we can't do anything with that. So that's also where it's quite helpful just to document when you've had a trauma and tragedy. And I don't always open those journals, but they are there. And I've chosen beautiful ones for, for some of the more tragic moments and losses and traumas. And, and they're there. And when I do want to open them, they're available. And I can't change some of the bad things that have happened, but at least it's documented you know, it mattered, it meant something. And then, of course, reminders. So this is the, the more um, psychology journal that I was talking about earlier, where just, you know, when you get into a phase in your life and you're like, hmm, 
this feeling familiar? I mean, a familiar stuck feeling, or I, I mean, a familiar relationship scenario, or I mean, a familiar whatever health thing. That's very familiar. When did this happen? Yeah, it happened a few years ago. Let me go and check out my journal. What was happening there? It's happening now. So it's taking those learnings into the future. And then the, the things that happened in the past matter even more. So these are just many delicious reasons why we can journal. And if you really do, you're probably nodding your head and thinking, yep. Yeah. And if you don't journal, maybe you're going to start. And it doesn't have to be a book like this. But, you know, these are not expensive. And there's something delicious about getting a new journal. And I love pens. So all my birthdays, I get these from everybody. So, you know, doesn't this just look delicious? Like you just want to kind of get in there. Okay. So I see journaling like other people see food. Right. So one of my favorites is dream journaling. So I'm going to give you a crash course on this. And this is research-based because, you know, me, CBT, it's always research-based. And um, this is something for people, if you do dream a lot, um, I remember my dreams every night, at least four, I always have. And in my, in the eighties, I trained at WITS for my undergrad. And I remember in my second year, there was a, a very interesting teacher who taught us a lot of stuff around dreaming. And um, it was Jungian as well as Freudian. And um, I trained myself to remember even in more detail. So if you don't remember your dreams, some people just don't. And you want to of course it comes with a warning because then you're going to remember them forever before you go to bed at night you just set an intention just very gently you know unconscious you're going to be coming on duty soon night shift so um if there's some dreams you got some messages for me please bring them on and i'll remember them when i wake up first thing and it, it doesn't last more than two three minutes so quickly get your journal to write it down but let, let's talk about why on earth is there a blender on this page? That is a blender, okay? So the waking brain is very simple. There's a conscious, a pre-conscious, and an unconscious. So you see there's a dotted line between the top two. So the conscious is listening and talking right now. But all of you have got a pre-conscious dialogue going on underneath, thinking about all the stuff I'm saying, thinking about what's relevant for you, thinking about lunch, you know, thinking about lots of other things later today. So um, the conscious and the pre-conscious have a relationship when we're awake, and there's a semi-permeable barrier between them. But the unconscious is completely unconscious. We can't access that when we're awake. So this is the waking brain. So what happens when we are dreaming? So there's got to be some processing going on, and this is what happens. The conscious has gone to sleep. It's gone. And the pre-conscious is dumping all that stuff to be processed into the unconscious. Okay, so you may have seen this before, but this is pretty much what's happening. But now, what are dreams? Okay, so there's processing, because it's got to be processed and archived, but how's that happening? So let's say today you had aqua-colored things happen. So here's this input. This is what I heard. This is what I did. This is what I saw. This is what I ate. And now that's got to be inputted. Now there's a layer of emotional leftovers, if we can call them that. So we've all got that. Everyone's walking around with things that haven't been fully processed. Maybe they're recent things, maybe they're old things, but we've all got a layer of emotional leftovers. So today's aqua has got to go through, I just use colors, so the yellow leftovers. What's that going to look like? It's going to look like this. So your dreams are going to be this concoction. So some bits will be, oh, yes, I saw that person. That's why they showed up in my dream. Other bits you might remember, like, oh, yes, it's, it's triggered that, that, that. But then you see there's another color there because it, the dream also has its own stuff going on. And maybe that's sort of subtle messages from the unconscious. We don't know. But that's what a dream looks like. It's got this combination of all of these things. And then it gets archived, some of it. Some of it becomes part of the emotional leftovers again. So that's dreaming. And isn't that fascinating? You know, that there's all this amazing stuff that we can access. So the language of dreams is its own language. And I remember Freud said this. It's the royal road to the unconscious. So um, 
I do take a little bit of exception with Freud because he, his themes are mostly sex, death, and aggression. He clearly had not tasted chocolates. But anyway, so that's um, Freud. Jung went a bit bigger, and I more prefer Jung in many ways. So he spoke much more about symbols and archetypes. And we can think of dreams as letters from the unconscious mind. Okay. So let me tell you about some of the common symbols. So these are ones that Jung actually talks about. And these are ones that are kind of going to come up quite a lot. So one of the big ones is water. So water is classically to do with emotion and unconscious. So think about a water in a dream. So one of mine I had many years ago when there was quite a big upheaval going on was I was walking along a path and I like the sea, but I don't necessarily want to be in it. And next to me, there was a stone barrier like at Belita, I think, or Umschlange, they've got those walkways, but it was here, it was quite big. And on the other side of it, there was this massive ocean with these waves that were threatening to come over, but they never quite did. First, I was terrified, and then I kind of got fascinated by just the colors in there and these huge waves, but these walls were actually keeping them intact. So when I woke up, I chose to see that as, okay, you can manage these kind of big crazy things a little bit differently. So um, other themes can be you've got water and you're scared to dive into the water. Oh, I don't know what's in there. Maybe you're watching somebody else who's diving in quite happy. And then when you wake up in the morning, you might be, okay, that other person was diving in. Who did they symbolize? Because people we dream about are actually just us, okay? So that person was diving in. Oh, but I know that person. It's somebody who's been through many wars and they now feel confident. Or it's somebody who just approaches life playfully and just dives in. And maybe that's a signal from your unconscious to maybe observe that that's the way to approach this. Okay, so wonderful things you can do with water in your dreams. Then another massive one is a house. So sometimes we dream about our childhood house. Um, sometimes we dream that there are all these people in our house. What are they doing in my house? So the house is the self. So if you're feeling kind of, you know, there's too much input from other people, you may well be dreaming about a house where there are all these people and my walls are not great and my doors aren't working and I can't shut that door. And, you know, why are all these people coming to my house? Well, there you go. Or maybe in the morning you wake up and you dreamt about a much bigger house than you've ever lived in or known. That could be a sign that your psyche is expanding. Maybe you dream about things in the basement in your house. Well, that's good old unconscious, things knocking about in there. Maybe you went in there. Maybe you made friends with them. So there's quite a lot that you can do with that. And um, there's a school of psychology, which P Frederick Pearls came up with, Gestalt psychology, probably in the 70s or before. And he actually has various techniques around dreams where he says, sometimes if you wake up and you're very disturbed by a dream, continue it. So say if you did have a house dream and there was stuff happening and people just kept coming in. In your mind, maybe you just make very strong walls and maybe a door with a doorbell. So people need to first check with you if you're ready to receive them. Or if there are things knocking around in the basement or chasing you, turn around and ask them what their name is. You know, hi, well, what is it that you want? Even if it is a big fearsome monster. And sometimes you can have a conversation. So you can see how dreams can just be an opening to all sorts of other things. Okay, clothes. So that is all about how we want to be perceived by others. And haven't we all had that naked dream or you're in PJs or something? So that could be to do with your image is shifting or are you comfortable with your image? Do you feel vulnerable, um, not good enough? You know, so you, you will know, believe me, as you're writing it, it'll come to you. It'll be, mm, yeah, it's this. Or even if you go to Dr. Google and you look at all the, the things that say clothes could be, things will pop up and they'll resonate and then we can journal them. Now, death, we're all scared of death, but death in a dream is to do with an ending or a change. So there's that beautiful saying, which is that, or the caterpillar, what is death for the butterfly's birth. And it's the same being going all the way through. So um, death is actually very powerful. And, you know, sometimes 
when I have clients who, who say, you know, they feel they just want to end it. Um, maybe it's just because I'm older, I feel confident to say this sometimes, that yes, there's got to be a death. And they always look at me like I'm mad. And I say, yeah, you, you can be death, you know, permanent solution to a temporary situation. And please say this carefully. Or there can be a death to what? To this pattern of you just on the treadmill all the time. That could be a good death. You know, I'll help you kill that one. And, and you know, so I, I mean, I'm being a little bit irreverent now, but I'm saying do that with yourself. That sometimes you just feel like, okay, all this death happened in my dream. Well, what does that symbolize? What's my unconscious trying to tell me? You know, and like if you dream about a dead child, is that because your inner child is dead? You don't play anymore. If you dream about somebody who has died, um, my mom passed away five years ago and we were very close. We were very different, but she had really sage advice. And sometimes I dream about her. And in the beginning, it was processing dreams. It was, I remember about six months later, she appeared in a dream and I was like, oh, mom, you're back. And um, we had a big conversation, but nobody else could see her. And that was all about the inner mom, you know, that she's still in me, her wisdoms, and I could access that any time. So I interpreted it like that. It felt that way the next day. But there can also be actual death. You know, you're at a funeral, there are dead bodies. Um, and what is dying? Those are sometimes aspects of us that need to die because we need to shift to the next level. Or maybe we're scared of a change that's coming. Okay. Mountains are obstacles. So how do we approach the obstacle? So if we don't have obstacles, we just be very beige and boring. So sometimes we need them to train us and, you know, make us um, a bit more resolved. And they're good for us sometimes. I used to be a runner and my coach would make me do hills all the time. And it really helped when I was doing those long, long distances. So um, we always want the downhill, but that isn't necessarily a good thing. So if we're dreaming about mountains, okay, what's up with that obstacle? How am I going to approach it? Do I feel stuck? Okay, so I had a horrible dream where I'm stuck with this obstacle. So what do I need to do internally, externally? What do I need to work to work with this obstacle? Maybe I didn't even know I had an obstacle. I didn't want to admit to myself that I had one. So that's also quite a, a useful one to look at. And then also just remembering that people in our dreams, you know, it's quite funny how we are. And we wake up and we dream about someone and it was a nice dream and we think, oh, they're so nice. And then what do they do the next night? They betray us and we wake up and we're kind of angry, you know, how could they? And we just miff with them all day. Now, those people, the poor things, uh, they, they are placeholders in our dreams. So if you're not sure about this, go and read about Jung and archetypes and you'll see what it means when you dream about different people. They're symbolic. So you can think, who is that person in my life? You know, it, is it somebody I admire because of? Is it somebody I don't get on with because of? Um, is there maybe unfinished business with that person? But it's about you. Okay, so this morning is all about you. And so all these symbols in your dreams are also about you. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so journaling your dreams. So you can write or you can draw the main points or you, you can just do it as a narrative, like a story of what happened. Um, I often do drawings, just um, line drawings. And um, some people like to really illustrate and go to town and you can. It's your journal. No one's supposed to be looking in there. And always, what is the most striking scene? So as you wake up, which scene, it'll be one, is the most striking and will be very colorful and quite emotional usually. And there might just be an object in there that just is very, very striking for you. That's the one that's got the message in it. And you can also note how you interacted with dream objects. So um, I helped somebody process a dream some time ago where she'd been caught with a bunch of people, a bunch of freedom fighters, and they were all her friends. And, and, you know, I think we are all that kind of personality. And she very nobly chose to be the one who'd be tortured because she thought, well, the rest of us all have partners and kids and stuff. She'll be the one, which is saying something about her. And she was quite surprised that she was the one. And um, she then interacted with these torturers in a certain way. And, and she was quite freaked out by a lot of these scenes being dragged back to the cell. And 
afterwards when we were processing, we interacted with the soul. How does the soul feel having to contain somebody and trap them? How does the torturer feel that they've been told by the king, I think it was, that they have to torture this person for information? And they're not all psychopaths. How does the, the God feel who has to take this person there? And how do the, the shackles feel having to shackle somebody, you know, to be tortured? And it was quite interesting. How did the things outside the bars feel observing this being? And it, it was just a very interesting kind of discussion. And later on in the dream, she escaped. And then how did the door feel opening to let her out? And, and it's, it's very interesting for you as well. How do you interact with these dream objects? Especially if, if you just can't process this thing away, you can journal it. Okay, the shackles are talking. Now the floor is talking. I'm very, very powerful what you can do. And of course, how did you feel? That's the big one. So I, I love mindfulness, but you've had so much delicious input. I'm just going to do a short one now. So when you're journaling, awareness is critically important. So your daily life is obviously not you with your journal. And so when we talk about awareness, we're talking about on the cushion and off the cushion. So if you journaled something and you want to be aware of that particular theme in your life or in your day, then you've got to kind of set reminders in place. So maybe you could do that. And this just helps us awareness, you know, that when you're trying to change any habit or when you're trying to implement a new habit, you need awareness. So when you're journaling, you might have all these ahas, just like when you're meditating, you might have all these ahas, but you want to take them into your life. So if, if there's a particular word, maybe put it on a post-it, stick it at your desk. And when you look at it, oh, yes. And you just take a moment just to be aware. So maybe you're trying to change something and maybe you put their doing, being, just so you remember I'm a human being, not a human doing, or something popped up in your journal which is, um, I'd like to be more mindful of, or, you know, I want to let go of, and then you just put up little reminders. So that's just a useful way of drawing all of this together. And often, you know, we, we talk about mindfulness as um, being aware of an outer, you know, um, so somebody doesn't just pop up next to you and you get a big fright, or so where are your keys? But the inner awareness for me is as if not more important. So think about when you were eating, you were aware of a lot of external things and internal things. So when you're journaling as well, it's the inner, the rich inner, the language and the feeling and the body intelligence telling you things as well as the emotion. So um, outer and inner awareness are really important to know where you are. Think of how often you just lose your cool and you think, oh, I didn't realize I was building. So this really works. The journaling helps that inner awareness. And you've had loads of meditations. So I'm just going to teach you one quickly, which is for distraction. So when the mind is just going zing, 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 and you're very, very busy and you, you want a journal, and maybe you've got it all out into the journal, but maybe you kind of just want to settle so that you can almost hear what the language is saying to you. This is one of the best meditations. And I use it when my mind's just very busy or very full. So you can do it anywhere. So just where you're sitting, find a position where your back is straight, but not tense. Hands and feet are nice and stable. And then gently close your eyes, either partially or fully. And just relax. Take a moment to presence yourself. Become aware of the feeling of your body on the seat, the ground under your feet. And then what is helpful is to actually invite your consciousness inside. And also helpful to let it drop from the head center down to the heart center, just remaining present inside. And now breathing naturally through your nose. Please bring your attention to the feeling of the breath. Coming in. And going out. A 
and allow yourself to become curious about the feeling of the breath. When it comes in, it's ever so slightly cooler than when it goes out. And it comes in at a slightly different place of the nostrils from where it goes out. Maybe there's even a very gentle sound. So just allow yourself to become very curious and playful, just noticing how every breath is unique. And then you may notice that the mind starts to drift away because it always wants fresh input, gets distracted. And then you can gently bring it back to the next breath. So breathing meditation is like training a puppy, firm yet gentle, gently coming back to the next breath again and again. And so this is one form of breathing meditation where you simply observe the breath. And then the version of it that's very good for stopping distractions or certainly reducing them is where we're going to mentally count our exhales from one to nine. And normally you would do three rounds. We're just going to do one now in the interest of time. And so... If you get lost and you realize halfway through, you're not counting anymore, no problem. You simply start again at one. Every day is different. Some days you'll go from one to nine easily. Other days you'll need to come back to one. Doesn't matter. So the object of this particular exercise is to mentally count the exhales from one to nine three times. So let's do one round together. So the next time you breathe out, mentally count one. The next time two, and so on, up to nine. And now you can relax your concentration. When you're ready, gently open your eyes.